As a mostly mobile guy, I have to remind myself that even at a mobile-specific event, not everyone knows how big and important it is. So first, a brief overview of why this presentation matters. There are more mobile devices than humans. Yes, over 7 billion devices in use. Computer sales are plummeting. PC sales dropped 95% in 2013. Mobiles continue to grow and for several years now have outsold desktops and laptops. If you've heard that iPad sales are flattening, remember that's just one device by one maker. There will be more tablets sold in 2014 than desktops and laptops combined. Even with all the scale in place, mobile use rates continue to grow rapidly. Mobile traffic grew 80% in 2013. And I believe it. Depending on the survey, as many as two-thirds of the people in the U.S. only have a mobile internet device or prefer to use their mobile over a desktop or laptop, even when one is available in front of them or in the next room, to access the internet. You won't be surprised that the rates in places like Kenya, where connectivity is generally mobile, are over 90%. Almost half of all the data transferred over the internet in the U.S. this most recent Christmas Day came from mobile devices. So, design for mobile, adaptively, as you design your solutions on every platform. And that means most of the time we're going to design for touch, which should be a snap. I mean, touch is so natural. Anyone can design a touch-based system without risk of users hitting the wrong target or anything. Oh, you still have problems? Well, everyone does, because touch is still fairly new. We're still developing patterns of interaction, and we don't really, in general, understand how touch screens even work. What we used to know about touch was what Apple told us, the 44 pixel touch target. But that was based on some convenience of that platform's design and pixel sizes. It's not based on the real world. Now we know how to design for people, and for the many devices that people use, not just iPhones and iPads. We know how to design for hands, fingers, and thumbs. And we know this from 1,333 original observations on how people hold and touch their phones, at least 19 serious academic studies by others, which I referenced and analyzed, including one with some 91,731 users and over 120 million recorded touch events. 651 new observations, done in coordination with the eLearning Guild, on how people also use phablets and tablets in offices, classrooms, and the home. And I'm currently doing some additional research to get info on gesture and context. I'm sharing some of that data with you here today, but more is coming over the next few months. Now we know that people hold phones in multiple ways. We know this diagram is wrong, and you can tell anyone who repeats it. We know touch accuracy has nothing to do with finger or thumb size. We know it has no direct relationship to reach. There aren't no-go areas in the corner of the screen to avoid or put dangerous controls, just areas of more or less accuracy, which we can easily account for in design. No one, and no design solution, will yield pinpoint accuracy so you can use tiny targets. Biomechanics are simply more complex than this. More important, while some people use the phone with one hand, they then change, regularly shifting their grip to reach areas with another finger, to type with two thumbs, to cradle the device for more reach. The more I watch people, the more I'm amazed at how variable their interactions are. How they're comfortable changing their hand position. How they touch the screen in different ways to do different things with their devices as they change tasks and context. Phablets, the largest thing you'd consider a phone, are used a little more when sitting down than more normal sized phones. And tablets are used almost two thirds of the time in a stand or set down on tables. Large tablets, like the 10-inch iPad here, are used about a quarter of the time with physical keyboards and almost 10% with pen styluses. Yes, that's a pen hiding a case there. 
In general, as devices get larger, they're used less and less held in the hand. Distance from the eye can be surmised by device class. And the smaller the device is, the more it is used on the move. Now on the move doesn't mean in buses or on trains, but can just mean when you walk around the house or office. Instead of finding time to stop and use that tablet on the table, or sit and type on the computer at your desk. Because different devices are held, or placed on the table, further from the eye than others, you need to make diff text different sizes. That's because we don't view anything based on size, but on the resolution at our eyeballs. And the relationship between this and that is called angular resolution. This is actually the simple version of the formula. To get to that 3438 number requires knowing the size of the sensors in your eyeballs and so forth. You don't have to take a picture of the formula though, I've done the math for you. And it tells me that very small phones, not all of which are tiny feature phones, can get away with tiny four point type. For most smartphones, six point. And for large tablets held in the hand, use eight point. For tablets used on surfaces or in stands, use 10 point. But do note these are minimums. Use at least two point larger type for almost all actual uses like body copy, even larger for more readability, for active environments, and for older populations. But the small sizes are okay for things like label under icons. The key use for text and icons is to label touch targets. As much as no affordance interfaces and secret gestures are a trendy way to insist you are making delightfully surprising experiences, making sure your simple actions just work is a much more sure bet. Make your targets work for your users. Visual targets, whether they're words, icons, or some other shape or UI widget, must attract the user's eye, be drawn so the user understands that they are actionable elements, be readable so the user understands what action they will perform, and be large and clear enough the user is confident that he can easily tap them. Following the size rules I already showed you per device class. There are numerous pitfalls you will encounter if you don't explicitly keep these guidelines in mind. Clickable items need to not just afford their action, making it clear what it does, but to do so consistently. Someone tell me why my calendar name, attendance, and the participants are selectable rows. But the location is a link, and I have to click exactly where the link is. Be consistent and make whole contained areas, rows, and boxes selectable, as that's what's expected. I keep mentioning touch, but in the same way I talked about angular resolution, first I have to give you a little bit of the engineering background and ergonomics. We're talking here entirely about capacitive touch screens. There are others, but we don't care about them today. Ask me if you somehow design for resistive touch. Capacitive touch uses the electrical conductivity of your finger to work. In part, this means that what is always sensed is the centroid, or geometric center, of the contact patch, which is just the part of your finger that gets flattened against the screen. And nothing else. The phone can't, in general, sense how big your contact patch is, so can't tell how hard you pressed or anything else. All it gets is a point that it assigns to be the touched coordinates. But that point is never ever perfectly aligned. There's no such thing as a perfect accuracy, so users miss. Accuracy is relative, and we define it with the circular error of probability, or CEP, which is just a mathematical representation of how much you miss a target. Here I use the R95 measure, or the radius containing 95% of the taps. When everything is imprecise, we stop calling these errors and refer to tolerances instead. You need to plan for imprecision and problems as part of the process. Touchscreen accuracy has nothing to do with the size of your user's finger or how hard they press, their contact patch size. But it does have a lot to do with is users' inherent pointing accuracy. Their current situation, and most repeatable and useful to you, the position on the screen they are trying to tap. This is a chart of the accuracy of touch on various devices, aggregated over very large numbers of individuals. Black is more accurate. So now we know how accurate people are and how it varies by section of the screen. We know that people are more accurate at the middle of the screen. And we do mean pretty much any screen, any way they hold their phone or tablet. They also subconsciously know this, 
or it may be tied to a preference they already have for reading in the middle of the screen. Some more are more confident at the center, and will slow down to tap corner or edge targets. And that means you can almost disregard the numbers I'll give you in a minute, and just remember to avoid the edges and corners. If we map that research differently, we can see how much more room is needed between items in various parts of the screen. The sides are a little worse than the center, but the top and bottom require much more room, and corners are just the worst. I actually think these neatly correspond to sort of structural zones that already exist in much of our design. Think of the rows you're already designed to with mastheads, tabs, the big content area in the middle, and the chiron at the bottom. If you aren't getting the rows I refer to, it seem like this. Mastheads at the top, tabs below them, content in the middle, and the chiron at the bottom. And if you look at the few squares I overlaid here, you can see how they correspond to the diagram where people touch screens accurately. Or not. You can see the red square where things are a bit too close together, also. I'm starting to call this designing by zones. You can just make sure those strips exist, and make sure they have proper spacing for the handset screen selected. To specify, design, or check for this, you can't just account for larger touch target size or measure a spacing between tappable areas. Your link or button is so variable and exists on two dimensions. What we need are guidelines and methods for interference alone. Whether you check digitally, or as I'll show later with real-world tools, you don't measure space between items, but space between centers. Center the size target in the tappable area, and if anything else is in the circle, that has a chance of being tapped by accident. These top icons are a bit too close together, and the tabs are far too short. So you can tap the action buttons or tweet by accident. The icons in the middle of the page are small, but most important is that missing them selects the tweet for viewing. This is a tactic. If interference is likely, Designed for resilience so the user can make do, but certainly never so there's an unrecoverable condition. Email format controls, for example, should never be right next to the send button. Send is an unrecoverable condition. Once you've accounted for interference, you want to design to not annoy. Things like this, where you try to click the link and instead open the reply dialog, are not a catastrophe, but could certainly be better. So I said finger size doesn't matter. Well, not for touch target size or touch accuracy at all. But they're still opaque. They do get in the way. This is anecdotal, but I've seen similar results on real projects. When I updated the new Twitter, I kept hitting the Add Person icon. Because it's got a plus, and it's visible in the other action area up top. But mostly because the Compose area down here was obscured by my thumb. Plus, I like to focus in the middle of the page like every human, so simply missed it while glancing around at the actual tweets in the middle of the page. This sort of behavior makes me abide by a simple rule. Don't put anything below the target, and maybe not to the right either. And by anything, I mean information about the target, so a sideways sliding carousel with labels below simply won't work well, or which is updated based on the user input. Notifications or a sliding input at the top of the screen that changes results below often won't work well. Generally, this is easy. You just flip things vertically, putting the updated info or label above, and you're safe. But think about your interface itself. Lastly, the, I say the best way to work with a lot of this stuff is to do it at device scale. Work on the device, send images and code to the handset. Sketch at device scale, so you start with it being the right size. Avoid too much reliance on your computer screen and on PowerPoint to show it off. Size guidelines are fine, but you can help yourself a lot and reduce your math time by just checking your work at scale. Take your design out of Graffle, Visio, Axure, Photoshop, InDesign, or whatever, and get it off the computer. No need for clever prototype tools, though things like Git Launcher Pop-Up do work well. You can just put screens in the device gallery. Try it out. Pass it around the room to make sure you aren't foolish, or to share the design the way it will really work and look in meetings with clients or stakeholders. Visit or simulate real environments. Here we drove down the street to a store where there were trial kiosks just using iPads. 
Later it was something else, so this was effectively a prototype. When it comes time to measure and confirm sizes are correct, you can do it directly on the device to make sure your sizes are right. You can use a circle template you get at the art supply store, or these days I suppose Amazon, but I made up my own little tool I keep in my pocket because I find this so important. That's a lot of data, and I have even more, but don't worry. I'll try to make it easier on you. Just follow these 10 guidelines to make your designs work for touch and people in the real world. Your customers hold and touch their phones in multiple ways, depending on their device, their needs, and their context. You can't observe yourself or draw conclusions from your friends or any other small group. 75% of users only touch the screen with one thumb, but that can be misleading. It's less than half also hold the phone with one hand, and that's just for phones. This is much less true for phablets and tablets, of course. 36% cradle the device, using a second hand for reach or to stabilize it otherwise. And fully 10% hold it in one hand and tap with a finger, giving a totally different interaction. So design for multiple contexts and for switching between them. Don't try to force your users into any one way of working. Users have what we can call a subconscious preference for viewing and selecting items in the middle area of the viewport. Follow the good mobile pattern of list views or grid views and put your main content and interaction in the middle of the page. Make sure menu bars, tabs, and action icons on the top or bottom are secondary functions. Fingers and thumbs are opaque. Notice where your user's hands are and don't put critical information or functions out of sight. For scrolling, people's thumbs or fingers are moving around the right half of the screen, or the lower third if side scrolling. That's because they're looking at the top and left of the screen. Yes, this is true even for left-handed users. So you have to keep in key information away from there, and especially make sure nothing that changes while they scroll appears in a place to be covered by thumbs or fingers. Make key information appear where the people are going to be looking. Because of the center preference, you need to make sure the bottom of your scrolling articles and forms are padded, so users can bring the last line of text or that last field towards the middle of the page. Otherwise, they will still try and waste time, then be that little bit more dissatisfied. And avoid this trendy way of showing pages that fit the viewport, but then snap the page so you can't really scroll. People don't like to read like that. The larger devices get, the further away from the eye they are used. Small handsets are filled very close to the eye, larger ones in phablets further away, and tablets at approximately desktop distance, since so many are in stands with keyboards. Minimum text sizes vary from 4 points to 10 points, depending on the context, but we, we can make good content guesses based on device class. Icons and other elements follow these same scale rules, and can roughly follow about these sizes. They have similar concerns of readability as text. Be sure to provide the largest practical touch targets. Don't just code the word or icon as a link. But like these guys do, use natural boundaries in your design. Boxes, buttons, and whole rows. The selectable linked area also. Tap anywhere nearby and you hit the target. Look around and you'll see this is known best practice. Google Drawer menu isn't as small as it appears, which is that little arrow. A default implementation also opens it on selecting the branding, so it's much easier to tap than it appears. Lots of hybrid apps don't notice this and code it wrong. Design by zones, spacing selectable items to prevent interference based on how well people touch parts of the screen. You can almost get away with calling this tip avoid the corners instead. Edges and corners have less accuracy. When putting items here, space them further apart and use fewer tabs or menu bar items. The sides are also a bit worse, so avoid actions that take place only at the left end of a list. Take advantage of the natural middle selection preference and improved accuracy. Remember to plan for interference and space unrecoverable or annoying to exit items far from others and to provide on new features and so forth. Make sure selectable items are clearly selectable. The jury is still out on the details here, but I'm seeing enough observations I'm comfortable saying what seems obvious. 
If it doesn't look clickable, people don't know it is. Underlines aren't bad for text in line, but you mostly need to bound items. That doesn't mean everything has to be a bold box or default style button. Here, simple translucent backgrounds in the menu and controls, and a sort of circular tab strip suffice to find them as functions. I'm starting to see that any bound item is considered selectable. If a visual designer had boxed the title element for consistency, people would assume they can tap it to get more details. This is better. It's differentiated by a distinct style and combined with a few typical icons like play, clearly say these are all clickable. If you use gestures that involve dragging from off screen, you might be forgetting about raised bezels. I mean, phones are flat, right? Well, no. Plenty of a raised bezel to protect the screen and many, many users put cases on. What this means is that many users cannot actually get to the edge of the screen. If they really press their finger, they can get skin into the edge, but remember the screen senses the center of your contact area. It's going to think the user is touching around here somewhere instead. Avoid edge gestures or provide plenty of padding at least six millimeters, more if you can get away with it, so that your sensing works for all users with a case. Draw on paper, put your designs on the phone whenever you can, carry the phone outside and actually tap on the screen. How it works and looks on the real device in the real environment is very different from how it looks on Photoshop in your computer. And make sure everyone else do this also. Pass the phone around the room instead of using the projector, when ideating, branding device templates and devices so everyone cannot just wave their arms, but try out your product and others right there. Most of all, designed for hands, fingers, thumbs, and people. If you want to read the articles and research reports it's based on, just see my design pattern wiki or ask me. And if you forget to write down these addresses, just Google my name and you'll find me. I'm happy to discuss any of this. And ask me to help address your specific problems or concerns. I've worked with big companies and small, globally and locally, on webs, apps, wearables, data, and more. My book is not about how to make the best iOS app or anything, but the best mobile experience, regardless of your technology. I'll be happy to help you create the best experience for your users. These two links up here are always the latest version of the deck, or a probably slightly older video of me narrating it. And I wanted to thank my friends at ZipGun for some of the software development work involved in my current research, UserTesting.com for donating testing services to the cause, and the eLearning Guild, and Patty Shank specifically, for giving me access to a bunch of researchers and helping with analysis.